Hi everybody, this is Charles broadcasting from Colorado. We get to make another video on propaganda, my favorite topic, or increasingly becoming one of my favorite topics thanks to uh, recent events. I was having a little bit of a Twitter spat and I wanted to show you guys this particular thread here. Uh, so I'm a really big fan of Dr. John uh, Ioannidis. Uh, he's at Stanford University and uh, he's an epidemiologist and at the medical school. And uh, what makes him very special is that he's really good at meta studies. And so he's an expert at the construction of good science. So he's kind of a doctor's doctor. So when you're a physician uh, or you're a scientist uh, who's doing applied things and you're having to make professional decisions based upon scientific output, uh, generally speaking, you have to scrutinize studies as they come. So you'll read things at the Journal of American Medical Association or the New England Journal of Medicine, and they say a bunch of stuff. And you have to read that article critically with a keen eye, and hopefully you're able to interpret whether it gives you something to think about or if it's not really significant or not. Now, what meta science is about is saying, okay, well, we're going to do that across all studies. So, for example, we're looking for the perfect diet. So we're going to take a look at everything that was said on the Mediterranean diet and all the construction and uh, see if these things are constructed properly or not. And he says, this, this guy that actually does that, and he's very, very good at building studies and understanding what is good science versus not good science. And so naturally, uh, I've been waiting uh, for him to start making some public statements about uh, COVID and uh, basically his opinion of how serious things are, or what we should pay attention to. Uh, and what was really unique about what he was talking about uh, was that uh, after looking at the antibody studies that the case fatality rate looks like it's converging to the flu. Uh, but there's a caveat in that this particular disease does seem to affect uh, certain cohorts of people, groups of people, uh, much worse than the general population. So if you're in the general population group and you get this, according to uh, this physician, uh, in the studies he conducted, uh, basically it's like getting influenza. Uh, but if you're at an at-risk group, um, your CFR could be a lot higher. So he spent about 40 minutes in an interview going through a, a lot of the questions. And the crux of all of it is whether we should continue the quarantine or end the quarantine. Now, what's really interesting is I, I posted this video and I said, here is the top doctor to listen to about studies, medical research, and things like COVID. And uh, one of the first people to comment says, yeah, just like during the Spanish flu when millions died from the economy, oh, wait. Okay, well, actually, in this video, uh, he specifically mentions that uh, the evidence clearly shows that this would have never been, with or without quarantine, the Spanish flu. Just would not have happened. Those pools aren't big enough. And then I said, well, once you've been propagandized, you've been vaccinated against facts, observations, and evidence to the contrary. And then she goes on to say, propagandize, seriously. He admits that we have to act without the data. He never once said that in the video, but argues that we. Uh, maybe further gagging ourselves. Uh, again, he never really once said that. No sane person could argue with that position, but every insane person will use it to justify its just a flu stance. So he presents the data he collected himself, studies he did himself, which clearly indicate, and there are other studies that are coming online that clearly indicate, one, that the amount of people who have this, a lot more than we thought. And two, it's not as deadly for the vast majority of us as we originally thought, which is good news for everybody. But for some reason, we live here. And why? Why do we live there? Well, it's because of propaganda. You see, this is a great example of what I said in my prior video, which was the test for propaganda. Let's see here. Uh, clear canvas. The test for propaganda, which was you, this idea of a strong emotion. despite the fact that you don't really know a lot about it, yet you feel super confident in your opinion. You see, I, I've been on all sides of coronavirus because I'll be the first to admit, I don't actually know uh, a lot about epidemiology and I don't know a lot about uh, treatment of pandemics. And to be frank, most people don't know a lot about the treatment of pandemics, even the experts who are treating them because they're so infrequent. We, generally speaking, don't have 
giant influenza pandemics every year. Uh, they come around maybe every 20, 30 years, like uh, the Spanish flu and the Hong Kong flu and these things. And uh, we have different techniques and uh, trial and error. And, and every time they occur, society is different, medical science is different, uh, social structures are different, uh, the level of globalization has certainly been different, transportation and communication technology is different. So every pandemic is a snowflake. So we are all just kind of learning as we go. Despite that, you'll notice strong emotion. They know little about the topic, yet very confident in the opinion. You know, going back here, uh, well, just like the Spanish flu. Well, right here, this doctor is probably one of the best people in the world to listen to. He's extremely cautious. He's a scientist. Uh, he approaches things with an open mind. He has no pol political goals in particular. He's just looking at where the data takes him. And he said explicitly from the results of the science that he conducted, the experiments he conducted, that the Spanish flu is impossible, that this was not going to be Spanish flu. Just because if you have a situation where we're already seeing antibody rates in the 1% to 3% in the populations we have, and given that the quarantines were not instituted until March, so we had several months prior to that, and it was obviously spreading a lot faster and sooner than we thought, it means that the vast majority of people who have this are asymptomatic. And so then we kind of think more broadly, we have kind of this known unknown situation. So we are still living in a situation where we have a lot of unknowns. We have unclear data. We just don't know how many people have actually gotten it. We don't know the case fatality rate. One of the interesting things he mentioned in the video was examining the Italian case fatality rate. The people who were dying in Italy, almost everybody who's died had some other medical condition. And in many of those cases, when they perished, uh, the other condition could have killed them as well, not just the coronavirus. So it was, for example, put as a COVID case when there was something else, maybe congestive heart failure uh, or, you know, uh, severe end-stage diabetes or something like that. But they just said, well, that's a coronavirus death. Well, to be frank, this could have certainly killed the patient uh, and perhaps was probably the leading contributing factor why the patient died. But we only counted it as coronavirus. So both the numerator and denominator don't look so clear in Italy. And there's a lot of other things here when we actually start breaking down the unknowns. But then there are knowns that we have. And I think I'll start sounding like Donald Rumsfeld. So for example, we know that the suicide rate increases by about 1% for every 1% of additional unemployment. So if you have an event that suddenly spikes the unemployment rate dramatically, a lot more people start killing themselves. And that can be thousands of people. We know that the domestic violence rates have been going up. We know that millions of people are losing their jobs, so massive economic consequences. Okay, and you can continue making that list. Now, what's happened is we also, for example, uh, here's another interesting thing. A lot of elective t medical procedures are being delayed, which is causing suffering. And in some cases, actually death, because it was elective today. And over time, it got worse. And then it's gotten to a point where that patient can't get the care that they need. And uh, perhaps they died as a consequence. So a lot more things live in the knowns category the longer that we run the clock and keep this quarantine running. And we are doing that off of the basis that if we don't do that, well, we go to Spanish flu and 20 to 50 million people die. And then we suddenly start getting evidence to the contrary. Uh, we start getting data points, like Sweden is a data point, for example. Uh, these studies that were done out of Stanford are a data point. And there are others that are starting to accumulate. We also know something else, that we are starting to get evidence-based treatments. So not treatments based upon fast medicine, observational medicine, but treatments based upon slow medicine, 
uh, randomized controlled uh, drug studies, which will probably start coming online in May-ish to June. So we know that getting coronavirus in the next few months uh, is probably going to be very different from getting coronavirus over the few months after that. So it's kind of like that old saying, if you get cancer today or get cancer 20 years from now, same cancer, same situation, which one would you prefer? Most people would want to get cancer 20 years from now instead of today if they had to pick. Why? Because they assume that 20 years from now, we'll have substantially better treatments and better knowledge and so that the chance of an effective treatment will be there offsetting uh, getting cancer as an older person, especially if you're younger, like you're 20. You know, if you're in your 60s, you'd probably want to get cancer then instead of 80s because it's almost certainly going to kill you then. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. So the point is that we have all these knowns, we have these unknowns, and the whole point of governments, the whole point of public policy, the whole point of running an economy is to balance these and say, how much unknown stuff are we going to tolerate given the consequences, which are very, very bad here? Now, no one should look at this emotionally. They should look at this dispassionately. And there's a lot of straw man arguments. For example, they say, well, uh, you just want people to die because if we reopen the economy, then all these people are going to die. The very fact that you live creates risk and danger statistically to everyone else. If I get in my car and I go outside and drive my car, I am endangering statistically other people. Uh, I can catch regular everyday flu and go and visit my grandfather for his 91st birthday and spread it to him. And I could be asymptomatic with that flu and he could contract it. And because he has lung problems, because he uh, worked with asbestos when he was in the Marines, uh, he could almost certainly die from that. It's a very high case fatality rate. So my existence, my very interactions with people creates statistical harm. The question shouldn't be, well, if you do something, there's a chance. The question should be, how significant is the risk? And in the beginning, we didn't know. We had far too many unknowns. And if you watch that video I posted, there's this imperial study that basically was saying doomsday. Millions of people were going to die. This is the plague of our time. This is the Spanish flu, the once in a century event that's gonna end humanity, okay? So prudent wise people would say, all right, tactical retreat. I listened to Dan Cranshaw not too long ago and he used that term and I like it. This is one of those situations where you walk into a building Suddenly somebody starts shooting at you. What's the first thing that you do? You retreat and find cover. And then you assess the situation. Tactical retreat and get your bearings, get assessment. And that's what we started doing. And now, months into this, we're actually starting to get real studies. We're actually starting to see real outcomes. And we're starting to find out that a lot of ICUs are empty. Uh, a lot of hospitals were told by the CDC, X people were going to die. And suddenly, now they have Y amounts of cases with X being substantially greater than Y, which means that the models and estimates were over, overly pessimistic about, uh, about uh, death. In fact, uh, it looks like the best case scenario is happening in almost all places, okay? So we're getting data, we're getting facts, and there are certainly domain experts who are coming online and telling us these data and facts and what's happening. And what's gonna happen is there's gonna be this uh, cop-out that occurs amongst the decision makers, the CDC and uh, the National Institute of Health and the WHO, and they're basically gonna try to get away with saying, had we not done any of the things that we've done, we would have seen Armageddon and the imperial model would have been absolutely right. Well, what this particular study was saying, if you really think about it carefully, is that we had very little ability to actually influence the mass spread of this disease. We really didn't. So no matter what efforts we took, a lot more people got infected than we thought were gonna get infected. 
And so as a consequence, had we done nothing, there's a strong argument that could have been made that while a lot of people would have died, it would have been no worse for the majority of Americans or in the world than the flu season for the majority population. Because you really think of this as kind of two pools. This is the young and healthy. And you know, the older who are healthy. Okay. And then the other pool. And this is the oldest and the unhealthy. And the reality is that this looks like flu. Here, really bad. In some cases, we see CFR of greater than 5%. So the question is, well, hang on a second here. Could we actually do anything to prevent this group from spreading it to this group? Yeah, there's probably a lot of things we could have done. Uh, nursing homes could have been locked down. Uh, we could have had these people avoid hospitals wherever possible to avoid nosocomial infection. There's a litany of public health processes that could have been taken. Uh, isolation from the family, in some cases perhaps offering specialized lodging for these people, uh, especially for the economically disenfranchised with multi-generational homes. There were a lot of things that could be carefully thought about that would have perhaps been expensive, but certainly not in the trillion dollar range, which would have separated these two populations from each other. But that wasn't done. What we did is we lumped everybody together and said, had we not done that, then millions of people in this group would die which is anti-science. There is absolutely no data to support that conclusion. All the information we are now getting is to the contrary, regardless of what public policy was embraced. There is no reality where this would have been Spanish flu and 50 million of those people would have died. Just not going to happen. And yes, you can always straw man. You can find the 35-year-old healthy young kid who got COVID and died. You absolutely can find that. And for every one person you find in that category, you will find 1,000 people or more that live in that category. Similarly, yes, you can always find a younger person, a teenager who is suffering from cancer. But for every person that you find who has cancer as they're very young in their teens, you're probably going to find a significantly higher amount of people over the age of 65 who have cancer that's fatal. Okay, so you can play the numbers game as much as you want, but yet people seem to have strong emotions. They don't seem to know a lot about these topics, data science, epidemiology, how to consume research, and yet they're very confident in their opinions. Why? Because those opinions are not their own. Those opinions were installed by propaganda. And that propaganda that's being blasted 24 hours a day, seven days a week, is saying, if we don't do this, you're going to die, and it's okay to accept all the consequences here the high suicide rate, the domestic violence, the divorces, the massive economic consequences, the delaying of elective treatment and the suffering that that causes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The constitutional crises that are occurring, the lack of freedoms, no freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, now freedom of speech is being censored. We're seeing this in the private industry. YouTube CEO recently said that the YouTube will start censoring videos that don't conform with information from the WHO. So I guess uh, if I made a video a few months ago, according to YouTube's policy, saying that COVID had a uh, high probability of human to human contact, my video should be taken down because a few months ago, the WHO said there wasn't evidence that humans could spread it to each other. That's an example of an agenda. Something is seriously wrong here. And they're telling us all to accept all of these things because these unknowns are very dangerous. And they certainly are for a group of people. 
And then they give us models and studies, and those models are wildly wrong. They are riddled with bad inputs, and they're riddled with extremely unrealistic assumptions. For example, if you build trading models, all the time I see this, people come to me and they say, hey, I have a newfound trading model, super excited, and I have compared it against historical data, and you get a 35% return on investment per annum. And I say, that's great. And I ask, well, how do you, how, when you built this model, how did you account for the model's existence? And they say, what do you mean? I say, well, hang on a second here. Traders aren't lemmings. You can't just enter into a trading environment and start trading and making lots of money and then expecting that the actors in the marketplace aren't going to adjust their behavior as a consequence of your behavior. They're not going to just keep executing strategy one. They're going to realize that strategy one is costing them money, and they're going to change to strategy two as a consequence of your strategy. And here's what happens. Strategy two has been built in the presence of your strategy, and as a consequence, your profits are probably not going to be 35%. Similarly, when you talk about epidemiological models, any model where you're talking about person-to-person -person contact, once people are aware, they know that something is going on, behavior changes. What do they do? They start social distancing by themselves. They start washing their hands by themselves. They start wearing masks. They start paying more attention to their health and symptoms. Sick people are told to go home instead of just working while they're sick. So behavior in the face of initial inputs changes. But these models apparently didn't adjust for that, and so they just showed exponential growth and eventually some inflection point and then a gradual flattening of the curve. And so they said, well, we artificially have to install these things or because people are so stupid they're not going to do it themselves. And as a consequence, uh, then everything will be muted. And then what we notice is even in places where restrictions were not put in, people started adopting behavior which already started flattening that curve and flattening it two ways, the amount of cases seen. Uh, and then uh, also the model was just plain wrong about the case fatality rate. Orders of magnitude in some cases wrong. Millions of people didn't die in some cases, just tens of thousands or 20,000 and so forth. So not an expert, but I do know a lot about statistics, and I do know quite a bit about building models because we do have to do this. There's great books on this, like um, Scott Page. I think it's called The Model Thinker. And he's at University of Michigan. He writes, uh, he's an expert on the constructing models to understand both sociological, uh, economic, and uh, other phenomena. Yeah, so there's tons of literature on how to do data science properly, how to think about models, uh, how to get proper inputs, and also the conclusion is that no one model is ever a representation of reality. And the hard part is that when you construct models, it's very difficult to deal with dynamicism. You make assumptions about how people are going to react, but the more of those assumptions you make, the less connected to reality it ends up being, and the more difficult it is to get reliable information. Uh, so it's really hard in practice to model human behavior. Uh, th this is, uh, if we did it perfectly, we'd be really good at economic predi predictions, but we're not. And epidemiological models are in no way immune to this phenomenon. But here's the point. People in the media and policymakers are taking those models as holy canon and telling us that we must accept them at face value without any evidence. And when data is apparent to the contrary, it is ignored or politicized. The people who produce it are immediately attacked for no particular reason. And we're just told we're stupid. Even though we're shouting from the rooftops that there are very significant consequences to continuing these things. And those consequences will result in the death of people. And these are known deaths. They actually can be quantified. Uh, these are known consequences that can scar and hurt people for years or decades to come. These are known consequences that will lead to mass poverty, that will lead to mass homelessness, 
And if you're homeless, you're dramatically more likely to be raped, the, the, uh, to be imprisoned, to be the victim of physical abuse, death prematurely, to die from lack of access to health care. We know that that is going to happen. And it's going to happen on an economy-wide scale to millions of Americans and collectively billions of people potentially across the entire world if we allow these types of quarantines to continue for a long period of time. Then there's a question of vaccine efficacy. So why don't we have a universal flu vaccine that we just do it once, people take it, uh, and then suddenly they're immune to the flu forever because viruses mutate. So there is a very real possibility that by the time we have a vaccine for the original coronavirus that started spreading out of Wuhan, that that will no longer be effective against the ones in the wild. Yet we have people telling us that life cannot go back to normal until mass vaccination has begun. And uh, everything has to stay quarantined and shut down. And we have blood on our hands if we uh, desire to suggest anything to the contrary. Then you see things coming out of the WHO today and yesterday and the day before saying that we don't know if you have immunity. So if you contract this virus, we just don't know if you're going to be immune to it, or, and even if you are, for how long that immunity will last. And that's a true statement. In a technical sense, we do not have enough information for it. Now, we do know from other viruses, similar viruses like the original COVID, the one from 2003, that immunity did actually come in for at least a few years and it tended to fade after about six years. But there was just one study off of a small sample size. And there are other factors above and beyond just the presence of antibodies that could potentially provide immunity, which was actually mentioned in the video that I shared. It was a very comprehensive video uh, that, uh, that covered a lot of good information. And anybody who listened to it can be reasonably well informed about this. Uh, so it just seems utterly intractable to say that we have to shut down our entire society for a year accepting that these things are going to grow at a terrible pace and cause horrific harm to the global order and society and to send many nations into depression and in many cases bankruptcy and default and will lead to wars, social unrest, all kinds of horrific consequences while we're waiting for something which we have no actual evidence will uh, be effective or not. There are no vaccines that have been developed at the moment for coronaviruses that are terribly successful. And in some cases, there have been failed candidates that make you overly sensitive to corona. So instead of the vaccine preventing it, the vaccine actually exacerbates the consequences of it when you become infected. There are some animal models that were mentioned in the video that I shared. So, you know, we really have to think carefully about what are we going to do moving forward, where we're going to go. Can contact tracing, for example, be effective? There's a combinatorial explosion when you talk about cities. If you go onto the subway, for example, all those people on the subway have been exposed to hundreds of people themselves. And then by touching them, interacting with them, you've been exposed to all of those people combined. So realistically speaking, it's impossible to do contact tracing because of the combinatorial explosion of contacts when you talk about highly urbanized areas. It makes a lot of sense when you're talking about Cheyenne, Wyoming, or other places. So yeah, contact tracing makes sense as a potential solution for certain societies, but not highly urbanized settings. Yet, where are the places that cell phone apps are going to exist and be propagated for contact tracing and track every movement interaction you make? Oh, well, it's probably even going to be built into your phone from Apple and Google, and highly urban areas are going to be impacted by that, first and foremost. It's not a conspiracy theory. Apple and Google have already confirmed that they're working on this technology, and it's quite easy for them to use the location services that they have built into Facebook, Google, and Apple products uh, to facilitate a social graph and share that social graph with whomever is desired. 
and there's no terms and conditions about when it's going to be turned off. For example, here's a scenario. Let's say the vaccine is not effective. And this thing continues. Well, they'll say, okay, I guess we can keep doing things, but we have to do contact tracing as long as the virus is in the wild. So that app will never be turned off. Are you willing to accept that? Well, apparently, when we go back to propaganda, you know, people like this will say, well, if we don't do it, Spanish flu will happen. Okay, so that's just a false argument, but that's bad data. And they've already signed up for something like that. I've already signed up for the loss of constitutional rights, already signed up for the higher suicide rates, the domestic violence, the suffering, the death, the mass unemployment, already signed up for the catastrophic economic damage. All of these things, because somebody said something based on models that were not correctly constructed, and it's blatantly clear that they're not correctly constructed because the things they said were going to happen didn't happen. And of course, they say, well, the inputs weren't right. Okay, that's great, but how can we know they're right now? And can you go back and justify that? And we can have a real conversation about it. But they don't. And they don't also attract the dynamicism. People change behavior once they know that something has occurred and they change their strategy. This is what makes modeling so hard and makes games so much fun. It's what makes trading unpredictable, and it's what makes diseases unpredictable. But yet, somehow, we're just going to destroy our whole society uh, based on static things. So this is why I share these videos, and when I see these things and they come up, I, I point them out, and I, I feel very, very, very strongly about them because I am seeing the consequences of this right in my own community. I'm hearing the consequences of it. I, I feel the consequences of it. Uh, I'm seeing doctors being laid off. This is the craziest thing. You'd say, how is that possible? We have a pandemic. This is like the one time when if you're in medicine, it's like the golden season. You should be working 100-hour weeks, right? Wrong. Because all those elective procedures have been shut off. We have whole hospitals that are empty. We have tons of people in the medical business who have no work because they've been told they can't do anything because of these quarantines. So we are actually seeing medical personnel, doctors, nurses, other people being laid off in this economic environment during a pandemic. Massive shortfalls in revenue for all of these different groups. That's a consequence, and it's a known consequence. Everybody in the business knows it. And we just seem to accept it because if we don't do anything, it'll be the Spanish flu. But then that's already been proven wrong by all available data, every place we've collected it, from New York City to Santa Barbara to uh, Sweden, Amsterdam, many places. Nor uh, and then they say, but, but uh, look at the Norway model to compare that with Sweden. Well, Norway is doing a quarantine and and this is another example where people lie with data. They conflate things and they don't understand confounding factors. So they say, well, Norway's doing a quarantine and, and their, their mortality rate is significantly lower than Sweden's. Well, Norway's a super sparsely populated country. So Wyoming would be the nearest neighbor to look at population density to compare Norway to if you extrapolate things. And Nor Wyoming has probably one of the lowest death rates in the entire world for COVID. I think only a few people have died in that entire state, 500,000 people. So that's a fair comparison, not Sweden. But you, you see people like doing apples and oranges comparisons. Uh, so this is a, just an example of where we're at. So anyway, that's propaganda too. And I will continue talking about it. I'll continue mentioning it. Uh, you know, I think you guys need to Think for yourselves. You need to look at things carefully, and if you don't have the skill sets to do it, you need to be intellectually honest that you don't have enough skills to actually analyze the arguments and understand what's going on. Otherwise, you will become, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I'll circle it three times in three different colors, the victim of propaganda, and that propaganda will be installed into your brain and you will have a strong emotion about things you don't know a lot about, yet somehow you'll be confident about that, you'll be confident about your opinions, and you will even attack others. You'll feel so confident that you must go to Twitter, you must go to Reddit, and attack others and label people, and then use simplistic counterarguments.
about these things, simplistic arguments such as, well, they politically benefit or they financially benefit or uh, they're part of this group or, you know, they're, they're team red or team blue. So you'll just use these off the shelf craziness, especially when those people who you're attacking happen to be domain experts. There are very few people alive more qualified than the person I posted. And he had no opinion on this until he did the research himself, painstaking months of effort. And uh, you can certainly argue against the studies and say that there was a problem with their construction. Clearly, there was a problem with the imperial model because it didn't happen when it said it was going to happen. So it's pretty easy to argue that there's a problem there. But you can argue against the data. You can argue against the studies and say that there were structural problems with them. Uh, and that's perfectly legitimate, especially if you know a lot about a topic or you happen to have certain skills that uh, give you the ability to really assess things or there's glaring obvious flaws in the design. For example, uh, there's been a lot of medical school professors who have criticized the remdesivir studies that have been asked. So remdesivir is a, is a drug to treat coronavirus. It originally was an Ebola drug that was developed as an orphan drug back in, I think, 2014, somewhere around that time frame. And it didn't work so well for Ebola, but then there was a lot of uh, anecdotal indication and models that indicated that remdesivir could potentially be very powerful, very effective for the treatment of coronavirus. Okay, so there's been some studies that were constructed, and I actually shared uh, a medical school from, I believe it was Vermont's uh, professor's opinion on one of the studies that was pushed through. And uh, he literally posted a GIF of a dumpster fire uh, for that study because he pointed out in a, in a blog post flaw after flaw after flaw and conflicts of interest in the design of that study. For example, when somebody says, well, this drug works or doesn't work, you have to think about where in the patient life cycle are we? Is it they haven't gotten it, so uh, not infected, and you're trying to prevent it? Are they just started? Are they in the hospital? Are they in the ICU? Are they in the ICU and ventilated? You know, so there's a whole bunch of parts of that life cycle and perhaps the drug is super effective at preventing it, but if you're in the ICU, nothing will save you. And, there's, and then you also have to think about the patient themselves. Certain patient groups seem to respond better. Yeah, this is the magic of medicine. This is why randomized control samples are, are so powerful and, and so nice to have. Uh, this is why Mengele like twins, you know, because it, it's very difficult to design experiments in a way where person A and person B uh, are close to each other and that when you give treatment A uh, to uh, this person and a placebo to this person, that it's actually a fair comparison between those two groups, no matter how well you design things. And there are just so few cases where you can get that designed perfectly on the first try. Uh, so remdesivir studies, the jury is still out. I would love to see remdesivir be successful because it seems like it would be super effective here in the not infected group. So it would be a great prophylaxis to give to uh, hospital workers, uh, people on the front line to avoid infection, okay? But we don't know if they were cherry picking, and there's a lot of evidence in the preliminary studies that came out that they were cherry picking patients that they felt would already have good outcomes throughout this entire patient life cycle. So whether they were treated or not, the outcomes would be fine. And if you construct your groups in just the right way, you can make a drug look far more effective or less effective uh, for whatever reason you want, usually commercial, sometimes political. So this is the point. That this is really complicated stuff. And there are actually a lot of great domain experts. Every medical school has them. Uh, they live in academia. They live in private industry. Uh, they come as a consequence of people who make money, like great traders usually um, have uh, some sort of quantitative capabilities. And those people deal with data all day long. And they can apply those to ask questions about models. And that's legitimate. But it's not legitimate 
to look at an hour long video, 15 minutes into it, start tweeting an attack, uh, basically assert that you're the domain expert, no more than one of the top guys around, uh, not mention a single thing about any of the studies, just basically reject the conclusion and do so with strong emotion, knowing little about the topic, yet somehow exerting enormous confidence. Why? Propaganda. So I don't fault people who do this. It's so easy, myself included, to fall victim of propaganda, especially on areas that we don't know a lot of things about. And, you know, human competency is not universal. So there may be some areas where we're very highly competent and other areas where we're not so competent. But because we're very highly competent, everybody just kind of gives us the benefit of the doubt on other stuff. And they think that our competence is equivalent. So, for example, you may know a great doctor who's absolutely brilliant at medicine, but probably you would not trust this dude at physics, yet somehow has a strong opinion about the recent uh, universe, uh, theory of everything, right? So domain competence is not transitive. It's not. Yet people implicitly do that, and they look at things like, well, if this person's rich or this person's famous, they're somehow more competent than they actually are. And so we all have to be aware of our biases. We all have to be aware of our deficits. We all have to be aware of areas where we don't know as much as we think we know. And we have to understand that if we're start feeling very emotional about certain things and we don't know a lot about it, and yet we're somehow confident, then that is not us. It's somebody putting it in your brain. It's propaganda. I keep saying it over and over again. I cannot emphasize it enough. Uh, it's it's really a war that we're fighting here against propaganda. And it's getting worse because the people who purvey it are so effective at doing it. Um, it's the old great lie that Girdles talk about. Um, basically, uh, this concept of repeating these things over and over again until people just assume them as universal truths when they're not. So you'll see Spanish flu repeated over and over and over again. Spanish flu, Spanish flu, Spanish flu, until you just start believing that if we did nothing, it would be the Spanish flu and 50 million people would die. And if you see any evidence to the contrary, you can't believe it because that's violating orthodoxy, common opinion. And so we just accept everything at face value, no matter how severe or damaging to our democracy, to our constitutional rights, to our economic freedoms, our political freedoms, uh, and accept death, in fact, because we think we're actually doing something to help when we should be instead repeating over and over and over and over again more data, more facts. more studies. And examining everybody's response, there's 184 countries that currently suffer from this. Are we looking at those 184 countries? Are we looking at their response in each and every one of them, seeing the variants? No, we're not. We're just assuming we know and responding accordingly. And anybody who has the audacity to say otherwise now the game has become the politics of personal destruction. So all the people protesting in the United States, the, re, uh, the closure of America and demanding the reopening of America, I did a survey, uh, kind of an anecdotal survey of media coverage. And you know what I saw? I saw the Nazi flag under the media. I saw the Confederate flag. I saw a huge political divide here. Basically, they said the only people who had the audacity to say that we should reopen the company, country are anti-science, are Nazis, are white supremacists, and uh, racists, and they don't care about anybody else. The, they just want to reopen it to get their hair cut. This is the argument that I'm seeing the media push in pictures, text, and in, uh, in every other medium that they can find. And they have not reported any of the contrary data to where we're currently at. This certainly is starting to look like just the flu for people in my age group and health group. It really is. For other people, it's not because diseases are different. So the conversation should be, how do we separate them 
in a responsible way that doesn't cause the destruction of our economy. Instead, it's let's quarantine or not quarantine. And if you're against quarantine, you're anti-science, you're a Nazi, and you're a Confederate racist, you're probably white and male, and you just want minorities to die. That's what they're saying. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's unbelievable to me, and it's disgusting to me, and it's going to hurt tens of millions of Americans. Uh, I'm already seeing more homeless people. I'm already hearing more cases of people unable to make their rent. The human suffering that this is causing is astronomical, and it's just beginning. And the longer that this goes on, the more suffering is going to occur, and the more death is going to occur. Uh, no one has the right to do this a long time. They really don't. And in every time I see studies like what came out of Stanford, our response to that should be, thank God, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. We have a path out of this. Let's use a data-driven and science-driven way to reopen things in a responsible way so we still minimize the consequences of, uh, of this on the most vulnerable and we can get back to work. And instead, it's by believing the things this man is saying, his studies are saying, you are part of the problem and you have blood on your hands and want lots of people to die. Every year, more than a half million people die on average from influenza. And, you know, the better job we do of treating influenza doesn't necessarily prevent those deaths because that pool is still available for other diseases to kill those people. That's what happened, it seems, in Italy, if we actually start digging into that data. They didn't have as bad of a flu season this year. And so those people who normally would have died from influenza, COVID got them. It's almost um, like what happened in Japan with the atomic bomb. One of the darker ironies of history was that the evacuation site of Hiroshima was Nagasaki. So we nuked Hiroshima, and then people fled Hiroshima to Nagasaki to recover, and then they got nuked again. Similarly, they a lot of people in Italy this year uh, in particular dodged the flu, and they didn't die from it. And then they got COVID and died from that. It happens. So uh, these are compli complicated things, and these things require a lot of domain expertise uh, and a heck of a lot of time. And unfortunately, we are not making decisions right now rationally or from a data-driven way, and I am seeing very clear evidence that people are being whipped up into a mass hysteria by propaganda for unknown reasons. I don't know why the media wants to do this. I won't even speculate on it, but for some reason they're doing it and it's causing dramatic consequences. And if we keep doing this, it will throw our entire country and the entire world into a global depression. And then that's gonna result in millions of people dying from the social unrest, the wars, the famine, you have to remember, when social order falls apart, governments fall apart. We have examples of that. Rwanda, Sudan, Somalia, these are not good situations. And the death toll from those situations is dramatic. Economic disruption at this scale does lead to these things, directly or indirectly, over an arc of time. And the longer we do this, the higher the probability is we approach that tipping point uh, and it's going to be disastrous for the entire world. So let's think. And let's not fall victims of propaganda. Think for yourselves. Don't give away your freedoms and your rights so freely. And it, I'll continue to apply that test. If you feel very strongly about something you feel you know very little about or don't have the skills to know a lot about it, yet somehow you have a sense of confidence about your feelings, someone gave you that confidence. And I guarantee it's not in your best interest. It's in theirs. So thanks for listening. It's always fun to do these types of videos. I hope everybody's doing well. Um, sorry that the uh, whole world's in this situation. Um, my best wishes goes out to the families and people who have been impacted by a coronavirus and uh, dealt with it. I already have a few friends who've lost friends, I've lost some people I know. Uh, it's tough. It really is. All the diseases are tough, and uh, it's always sad when these things happen. But we'll get through this, and I'm optimistic our best days are ahead of us. And I think the light at the end of this tunnel is that perhaps we can find better ways of doing things that we can focus on solutions instead of the things that divide us. Thanks for listening.